evening. Are you ready for some television in a movie theater? <laughs> Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater, home of the public programs for the UCLA Film and Television Archive. My name is Mei Hong Ha Zung, and I'm the director of the Archive. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of our ongoing Making Wave series centering BIPOC filmmakers and their work through conversation and screenings. Tonight, we honor the landmark indigenous American television series, Reservation Dogs, and the show's gifted filmmakers, <laughs> and the show's gifted makers, Sterling Harjo and Tazba Rose Chavez. Before we begin, we're joined by Dr. Shannon Speed, here to welcome and open the screening. Dr. Speed is a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation. At UCLA, Dr. Speed serves as the director of the American Indian Studies Center and is a professor of gender studies and anthropology. She has worked for the last two decades on issues of indigenous autonomy, social justice, and activist research. This essential work is reflected in her most recent publication, Incarcerated Stories, Indigenous Women Migrants in the Settler Capitalist State. Dr. Speed, thank you for joining us. Chukma. Thank you. Hashlaka Chukma. Greetings. Welcome, everyone, on behalf of the American Indian Studies Center. We're very excited about this evening's program. Gabrielino Tangva Yagni Makon, Apisa Hanchi, Pika Natoka, Hach Imanolili. That's my personal um, land acknowledgement as a guest on these lands. I will now give the institutional one. Uh, <laughs> UCLA, as a land-grant institution, acknowledges the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovanga. That's what we're currently calling Los Angeles. We pay our respects to the Honukvitam ancestors, Ahihiram elders, and Eohinkem, our relations, past, present, and emerging. Those word translations were from the Tongva, but I'll say Goodbye in Chikasa. Ayali Yakoki. Enjoy the show. We have more. Hang on one sec. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Dr. Speed. Um, we'd like to also thank all of those who's made tonight's event possible. Archive screenings in the Wilder are free, thanks to a gift from an anonymous donor, and we're grateful for their support, and to the Hammer Museum for our ongoing partnership. Underwriting for tonight's screening was provided by the Golden Globes Foundation, the John H. Mitchell Television Programming Endowment, and UCLA's American Indian Study Center. Extra special thanks are due to our essential collaborators and programmatic partners for the evening, the American Indian Study Center at UCLA. We'd specifically like to thank the center's event specialist, Pamela J. Peters, for co-organizing tonight's program. <laughs> Two years ago, Pamela emailed and said to the archive, wouldn't it be great if we did this? And I said, yes, let's do it. And then uh, just this past June, while in the lobby here at, at the Billy Wilder Theater um, for the Imagining Indigenous Cinema series that we did um, in June, um, I turned to her and said, hey, let's do that thing we talked about. So here we are. Um, for the archives contributors, there are too many to mention by name, but I'd like to call out our wonderful program, film programmer, Amanda Salazar, for her crucial efforts in shaping tonight's program. <laughs> and our John H. Mitchell television curator, Mark Quigley, for his creative input and support. We'd also, <laughs> we'd also like to thank the generous team at FX for their invaluable assistance. All three seasons for FX's Reservation Dogs are now available on Hulu, and we implore you to take them all in. I also want to thank you, our audiences, for making it out here tonight. When we envisioned the Making Waves series to center BIPOC filmmakers, 
The idea was really that we wanted to make a space where within the archive we can question the dominant paradigms, narratives, and stories that we've been told um, throughout our lives. And so tonight, this is part of that series, and with everything going on, I just really appreciate that you are present here to hold space for questioning those narratives that we've been told and for enjoying some really wonderful artistry. So we're here to set, screen two indelible episodes of Reservation Dogs that illuminate the brilliance of the groundbreaking Peabody Award-winning series. So tonight, as part of the celebration, we're incredibly fortunate and honored to be joined by two esteemed award-winning guests series co-creator and executive producer Storlin Harjo, as I mentioned, and series executive producer Tazba Rose Chavez. So I'll just talk very briefly about the episodes that we're watching, and then we'll um, welcome them on stage for a brief hello. Um, our first screening, uh, first episode screening tonight, um, Why Danette, was directed and written by Tazba Rose Chavez. Variety hailed the standout episode as a game changer for audiences in terms of how it spotlights its female cast. After Wide Net, we will screen Dear Lady, written by Sterling Harjo and directed by Dennis Goulet, of the episode which ex examines the horror of native boarding schools. Salon noted, Dear Lady exemplifies the enriching cultural potential that can be achieved on TV when underrepresented voices are given space to tell their stories their way. Following the screening, Sterling and Tazba will be joined by our esteemed moderator this evening, Dr. David Shorter, for conversation. Dr. Shorter is a tenured professor at UCLA and director of Archive of Healing. Having been raised by a curandera and learn, learning with healers in indigenous communities as well as in Japan. He serves as editor-in-chief for the American Indian Culture and Research Journal, a leading scholarly journal in the field of indigenous studies. Thank you, Dr. Shorter, for joining us. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming our special guests, Tazva and Sterling, to share a little about what you'll see tonight. Thank you. Steal another water over here. Uh, hi, I'm Sterling Harjo. Manahu, I'm Tazba Chavez. I uh, hope you enjoy the episodes. Before we go, I would like to say that um, Love You Bitch was something that she and I said lovingly to each other, along with Tyke and Bert, and that's where that came from. So that's how close we all are making this show. Would you like to add any? Oh, I don't know. There's a lot of pressure. Um, <laughs> no, I just, yeah, we should take a picture. Get, get me behind, like, okay. yeah. Um, <laughs> Do you like a lens flare? Though? Yeah, lens flare, <laughs> lights a little lower. No, um, I just want to say thank you, everybody, for coming out. It's so cool to be here, to see all of you. I'm an alumni of UCLA, so this is very special for me. Um, I used to stand at the top of Han Step and look out and be like, what am I going to do with my life? Like, how am I going to make a difference? Like, this college makes you believe that you can. And so it's very exciting to be here and to be screening these episodes with you. Please join me in welcoming tonight's moderator, Dr. David Delgado Shorter, and our special guests, Sterling Harjo and Tazba Rose Chavez to the stage. This is your school, your alma mater. You have to be in the center. See how he centers women? <laughs> I mean, both these episodes were directed by women, just centering. Thank you so much for being here. I have spent weeks throwing myself into the show and recognizing just episode after episode after episode that all I wanted to do here is say, let's just give a standing ovation for like 40 minutes <laughs> at how good this series is. And what a benchmark it is. Uh, 
All right, now you all have to stand up and clap because he asked you to do a standing ovation, and I have to have a photo of it. One, two, three, go. <laughs> tell, tell no one that was planned. <laughs> he didn't direct we'll, you to do that. We'll, we'll cut that from the YouTube video. Um, well, really, because she's a Bruin, we're going to just forget about Sterling for the next 30 minutes yep. and focus on <laughs> that episode was unbelievable for those of us who've watched Native representation on film, but particularly Native representation of women on film. That episode stands out. Was it a story you've been dying to tell for a while? Had you already known that when you had the chance, you were going to show Native women having fun? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. I, I think when this episode came together in the writer's room, it was one of those things that was such a joy to be able to pitch on. Joy for Native women, agency of Native women, sexiness for Native women, fulfilling our 90s dance dreams for women. Um, and... Um, yeah, I, I think that that's kind of what I aim in terms of my storytelling is the the fun that we're able to have, the sisterhood that we have, the joy that we have. Um, and I think it's so important because it's it's one of our greatest strengths as Native women. You know, you contrast that with the Dear Lady episode. It's like that Dear Lady episode is all of our histories, and yet those women are able to have the strength generations later to do IHS conference. You know, I think that's a testament to the, to the power of humor and Native comedy. Thank you so much for that. And you used a word there that I actually was going to follow up on. You used this, like, notion of generation. A lot of people, particularly, who want to help, you know, issues of decolonization, we think about intergenerational trauma, and that can be such a heavy word. Was there literally something taking place on set with the actresses and actors thinking that it's so nice to be able to do this instead of put on feathers and animal skin to play roles? You can feel the joy, like in the episode, and it's like the actors, the crew, directing, everything, and everyone's so happy to be doing it. It was such a relief. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it was a very good vibe, and I think, you know, in terms of the, the actresses, um, you know, the dance... Uh, I'm going to call it regalia, even though it's costumes. Um, you know, they had a heavy hand in choosing how they wanted to be seen. You know, when I talked to costumes, they're like, well, what, what should each person have? And I told our costume designer, I want you to talk to Sarah and to Jana and to Natalie and Tamara. And what, how do they feel best? What do they feel like their best selves in? And I think one of the greatest compliments I've ever had on this episode is from Sarah Podemski, who's in this audience, and she's... It's like who's who, she's so you really. can spot her. She's not really here, though. Because of <laughs> she's, oh, wait. Fuck. Take that she's off not YouTube. Here. She's lying. She's not, she's here. not here. She's Her spirit is. Anyways, I, I just want to say she's here with us in spirit. And um, one of the greatest compliments, I think, for this episode is that she told me that this is one of the few things that she's watched and not seen herself in, in terms of, like, she doesn't feel like she's that actress. Like, she doesn't feel like she's watching herself. And I think that's, like, a huge testament to having the freedom to really just play a person who's complex and real and having fun. Um, I mean, even when it, they were choosing their swimsuits at the pool, I only had one request. It's that the res kini was in there somewhere. And that was Natalie. But everybody else, like, got to wear what they wanted to. That was really important making this. Is I felt like it was more important that all of them feel their best and and like most vivacious selves in, in making this. Amazing. I couldn't help but think how many times, and, and previous Native authors have said this, that you really have to be the spiritual wise Indian for popular audiences to like you. And you went like a uh, marble dildo. Like, <laughs> did you write that in originally or was there any like on the set? Like, let's just do it. Oh, no, that same. was in the script. Wow. That was pitched in the writer's room. You wanted that too. Yeah, we wanted a crystal dildo. <laughs> Yeah, that it's funny because I was whenever I, I didn't remember this, but I was when I was watching it, the idea for that episode, like before it was the IHS episode, this is kind of how the writer's room works. It's like before that, I had been thinking about a um kind of like a hangover type thing. And then I had the idea of Bobby Lee, which ended up being Bobby Lee running down the hall uh with and couldn't get in the doors, but originally it was him uh just crawling out of a window. <laughs> 
in the on the res and like running and like trying and he's like in his underwear. Oh, he was gonna be naked, I think, in that one. And um, and then it's just you see, you see how like and then we in the writers' room and it just like evolves into like what it became, you know. Yeah. Uh, I I'm gonna stick with this in terms of like commonplace representations. So. A lot of times I've had either Native artists or Native writers tell me that they're almost expected to portray something from within their tribal culture in order to get popular audiences. And that's almost always been spirituality. So Sterling, for some of the, you might want to say larger, all three um, seasons, did you wrestle with how much to give of authentic song authentic mostly the i'm thinking of the funeral scenes but also when you have ancestors come in and you do a slow fade with their presence did that feel to you like you were responsible for representing cultural secrets a perfect way no uh i think that it was such a like blow up of all the horse shit that we've seen for so long and it was such a like easy thing to do all you had to do is tell the truth and all you had to do was not be afraid to tell the truth. And that was it. And like, literally, that was the guiding line. And like, also, you know, whenever we were first introduced here, it was like showing a TV show and a film movie. Well, the whole time, I would say, like, we're not making a TV show. We are not making a TV show. Like, we are making films, you know, we're making cinema, you know. And, um, but that was like the easiest thing because it's from my community. I'm not going to show a funeral without showing the truth of how that funeral works and the songs that are sung at that funeral. I always kind of felt like before Reservation Dogs, it was always like I was really hoping to have a chance to do this, but it felt like this race and it felt like some jackass was going to get the opportunity and we're going to fuck it up for the next 10 years for us all because they're afraid to tell the truth. And all we had to do was show exactly how life, hey, show exactly how life is. And, and like, yes, we wear slides with socks and basketball shorts sometimes, you know? Like, it's not insane. Just tell the truth. And that's such, I think, for any filmmakers and, like, and we would talk about that in the writer's room. For any filmmakers, or storytellers, or writers, that's such a, like, freeing thing. Like, you don't have to be magic. You just tell the truth, you know? You have to be good at writing, <laughs> but tell the truth, <laughs> you know? I would like to hear your take on that too. Like, do you feel like you're constantly put upon either by yourself or some view you have of the audience to portray indigenous culture a certain way? Like, is I it mean, there for you? I think it's, I agree with, you know, Sterling that all it comes down to is telling the truth. And if you're not doing that, then that's how we're getting poor representation. But the truth also means that we're not perfect. And the truth means that we don't overcorrect also. Um, I think that sometimes there's like um, a quest to correct the narrative in a way that sometimes can go like overcorrecting to where we like think about trying to portray each other as like perfect and no issues and we like pray under trees all day and like some Not of us truthful, do yeah. but some of us don't and some of us like you know and so I think what's beautiful about this show is that we're depicting the truth because every character you see in this show we all have in our lives you know back in our communities on our res like these are people that we really know and I think that involves being messy it involves being imperfect it involves being flawed and so I think that's also one of the things the keys to being able to tell truthful representation is like you had to do it all um and and not not like um get too rigid around like the representation thing yeah I last one about rep representation it's the flip side of the joy one which is that I, when in my classes on colonialism, I sort of struggle how much of the violence to show because I feel like it's almost a different type of violence that I'm now perpetrating through like, I don't know, voyeurism or something. Do you have that? Do you wrestle with that sometimes, particularly in that episode, which kind of kills me? I think that it comes back to truth. You know, it's like you can tell if someone's not being truthful with violence. You can feel if it's gratuitous. You can feel if it shouldn't be there. But if you're telling the truth... It feels like it should be there. And we, you know, there were times where I, whenever she's stabbing the guy at the end, I wanted everyone to feel some relief that like, whoa, she's, she's doing it, you know? Um, but I didn't want to show the violence on the children. You know, there's, you know, you have to like be responsible and like decide how you're going to tell that story. Um, but I think always it's just like to be truthful. You know, we get wild. I mean, like I've never 
met the actual dear lady. You know, like I've never. That's because you're a good man. <laughs> I know. She's never asked me if I wanted to touch her hooves, you know. Um, so truth is weird, right? Like it's not, I'm not saying you can't do fantastical things and fantasy and go insane. And we're great storytellers and we, we have magic in our stories, you know, like don't kill that. But there's truth within that. You know, it's like, are you telling the truth? Like, are you, are you portraying them? Even Dear Lady has a truth, you know? And if you were to not feel her truth in this, you would know. Um, she has a truth as a character, you know? So it's about telling the truth in all ways. And I think that... Um, you know, especially violence. You know, you have to be responsible with that, I think. And I, now that you say it, I actually see it in your episode, too. Like, they were they were truthfully feeling sexy and great on that dance floor. And they were truly stoned off their asses. <laughs> Both things are true. <laughs> so um, oftentimes we don't get a lot of insights into the, the other side, the filmmaking side. And the casting was just unbelievable for this series. I mean... Can you talk a little bit about what what you think made that happen? I I can't I can't recall her name. Your Angelique Bentender. Did she do all three seasons? Yeah, um, I hired her. I had worked with her before on a show that went away. Um, but and and you know she's uh, married to David Midthunder. She's mother of Amber Midthunder, who's the star of Prey. Uh, just a f longtime friend, member of the community, and I knew that she would like get down and dirty with me and we'd go find people. And, you know, we went to Oklahoma and different reservations and got tapes in. And, and the whole thing is like, you know, we don't have a lot of people in Hollywood a acting because we've not had opportunities to do that. So you have to go to the community and that's where you find people. And, um, you know, that's what we did. And we just went and like so many people came and it was crazy, you know, and there's like, um, just an amazing cast of people that I I'd worked with before or known. Obviously, some of the legends that are in it, but then the kids, you know, it was like they were all not had worked much before. I mean, Lane, who plays Cheese, um, literally like his mom bribed him with McDonald's when he was fourteen to take an acting class, and so he did it. <laughs> no, and bribed him to go to the audition. So he he was in an acting class because he'd been playing video games, and she was trying to get him out of the house. Then she bribed him with like a Happy Meal or something to go audition and then like he get you know and he and he's amazing and he doesn't even know he's amazing he's just like he is cheese you know and like and same with willie jack she is willie jack like that is paulina and so i met them she was auditioning for laura dannon and then she auditioned for cheese because i was just like we got to put her somewhere and then like in the end it was like i'll just mold those two characters to fit them like that's how amazing their personality is, you know? So those two characters were just kind of like little wise guys, you know, just kind of sidekicks. And, but then they brought this like thunder to those roles that were like, yeah, I had to like give them more, you know? And then everyone that almost got the part of the kids, they were in line. They, it was like kind of one big group that was like the finals, you know, and we did an audition here. The ones that didn't get it became the bad guy gang. Like Jackie, like, like for instance, like Jackie wasn't, um, Jackie's character, Jackie didn't exist, but she had auditioned for Laura and she was so good and like almost got it that I wrote Jackie as the leader of this gang who's blonde and she came in blonde. And so that whole thing was just based on her, you know? So we were really lucky a lot of ways. I mean, Lane goes on to being like the Fablemans, you know, like um, really lucky, but like also I think I'd worked with non-actors a lot and mix them with trained actors. So I'm good at that. I'm not afraid to do that. And I think you have to not be afraid with a project like this to put people together. My family's in it, you know, like like friends of ours are in it. Um, Tosba was in it, but she got cut. No. <laughs> That's how you know you're good at your job, that you <laughs> cut yourself when you suck. Uh, but even um, the the woman from um, Theta, New Rest, who was Dildo. the elder, what's that? So the dildos. Yeah. Um, she's a respected elder in Indian country, you know, she, and she's like, um, a wellness advocate. And, you know, I thought about her for casting. I, she's the first person I told Stern. I was like, Sterling, we have to, we have to get a tape from this woman. She's never acted before, so I'm not sure what's going to come in, but part of, um, 
that scene came from an inspiration of her in real life of a sex talk she gave to some of my girlfriends that she was at a conference with. And so I was like, who better to deliver this information than the woman who inspired this scene? And so, you know, Angelique's great because I could tell Angelique, like, I, I, wanted, I want Theta to read for this. And so she goes and she goes on her Instagram or her Facebook or however she gets held to people and she gets these tapes in. So it, it also happens in those ways really organically also. Amazing. I, I feel like there's such a generational difference or I'm feeling really old. Some of the great native actors that you had on this series, it was blowing me away when they'd walk in. Do the younger kids even know what they're doing when they're in a scene with this person? Are they Sometimes, familiar with the history? I remember one day Zahn, or Chi Lane was doing a scene with um, West Studi and Zahn and his mom was freak. Kelly was freaking out. <laughs> And and she's just, and Lane's was like, well, you know, he's like just talk. Hey, what'd you eat for lunch? You know, like that's him. And um, uh, he was like, yeah, my mom's really freaked out, right? Or no, she's like really like, she's like beside herself. And I was like, what do you, what, what do you mean? And he's like, because I'm acting with West Studi and Zahn. I didn't even know who they were, but like she showed me. Like he just had no clue, you know. But then of course some of them know, like amazing, you know. But also like Lane doesn't get too surprised. Here's a really funny story. We were at the there was a award show. And Lane was there, and Jeff Bridges was across the room. And all of a sudden, Jeff, you just hear Jeff Bridges go, Cheese! <laughs> and like went and hugged him. And he's just like, Wah! And he also, at award shows, goes around taking photos with all of the celebrities. <laughs> Well, and then you have a person like DeFaro who very much does know right. who these people are because he just respects the craft so and Paulina much. Knows too. That, um, you know, when he was doing the Maximus episode in season three with Graham Greene, he knew who Graham was and he stepped up. Like, right. he showed up to rehearsals. Com he didn't even have a script on him when they were doing rehearsals because he really wanted to bring his A game because he knew what it meant to work with someone like Graham. Yeah, incredible. I mean, congratulations on just who you got. And I think there's something else going on. There's more than kismet. There's something mythical and magical about how perfect the whole thing ended up um now on the opposite side of magical let's talk about the industry just for a couple like i remember i had gary farmer out to indiana university after dead man the jim jarmusch film and i was like oh this is incredible i mean you're in this major film and he was like yeah it'll be seven years before i get another right. moment because indians only are popular every seven years right. And so he, was, he literally like counted down. He's like, yeah, Dance with the Wolves, and then you have Pow Wow Highway. Then you have, and I was like, wow, oh, wow, sh shoot. You're going to have to wait a while. Um, yeah. Has anything changed on that? I or think you, so. Okay. I think it's a different generation of people that, you know, if you look back at some of those older films, no one was, like, opening doors for anyone and pulling people up to do stuff. And, like, if you um, – and that's not anyone's fault. It's just, you know um, – you had to wait for the next Western or whatever. But like with this show, it's like every one of our writers, every one of the writers in the writer's room has their own show that is like in development right now, you know, that's going to be rad when it comes out. And that's part of like ending it. I mean, also I thought it was a perfect ending, but it's also like, well, we got, we don't have a lot of us. Like let's get out of the way and let's keep making other shows, you know? And so I could have like kept this going for a couple of more years. Like FX would have been totally down with that but like it felt like it's time like it's time it feels like a good ending let's not drag it out other shows are being made um like i don't know like how many different how many new tv directors were created on the show like almost all of us you know are all of a sudden tv directors now or tv writers or whatever and everyone has a show and every i think it's going to be um i think we've killed that and i think it's because we've done this we were raised right and we were we've done that we're doing this industry in a way that we were taught we should which is bringing other people along and having it be community instead of like hierarchical and me saying like fuck all y'all like i'm gonna do this and then i'm gonna do my own show and i'm gonna drag this shit out till i die you know <laughs> like that's not what i'm wanting to do and i think it's changed i think it will change yeah it's changed um I'll give you an example of how I also think it has changed from, you know, even the writer's room. I know that, you know, you see the, the face of it changing in the actors, but behind the scenes, I mean, even like, you know, four years ago, I was a staff writer on Resident Alien. I was the only Native person in that room who was responsible with building out the Native characters in that show. The next show I went to, Rutherford Falls, half the room was Native, which I was like, wow, I never had Native coworkers before. Um, and then to go to Reservation Dogs and have an entirely Indigenous writer's room, you know, it's like 
each show that I went to became more indigenous. And um, I think that that is also happening behind the camera in the writing. Um, there's so many native writers in the WGA and television writers in comparison to like four or five years ago. And now that allows us to also go write on non-native shows even and sort of infiltrate from within and be able to place ourselves in other narratives. So it just is this really amazing thing from even the, the starting point of writing has changed a lot. Thank you. I, I want to come back at the very end here to go personal. In this city, I'm used to people not saying what project they're working on because you have no idea if the deal's set or if they want to like talk about it. So instead of like what's next, though I'm super interested, what's what do you want? What's next? What do you want? <laughs> yeah. So instead of that, what is next? No. I'll start with Sterling because I love the whole first full circle of coming back to our alumni for the last question. So what what would you love to do? We started to so tell much. how we hung out here. Yeah, After we have that. a story before we're done. So when we're done, we'll tell you the story. But. Um, what is next? What do I want to do? I don't know. I mean, I'm doing it. You know, like um, we made a show in the pandemic. Like literally, we were about to shoot this pilot, and the world came to a stop. And then we had to stop. We got shut down. And then a few months later, made the pilot. And then I assembled the writers' room. And then we made the show. And that's all we've done is made it in this pandemic. So right now, there's a little bit of like a victory lap of like, I'm going to say yes to every screening and every like, you know, because like, I mean, like, if you think about it, like I was telling this in dinner, but like, I've never, I never had a lot. I mean, in Oklahoma, I did, but like, not like, and which is wonderful, but like, I didn't go and and get like a lot of like, hey, good job in person. It was a lot of messages that were sent to me because it was a pandemic. So it's been nice to kind of just say, I'm done with the show and I'm going to do some other things. I have another show that is hopefully happening in at FX and then another show that I'm doing with Dana Goulet that um, is based on a podcast called Stolen, Surviving St. Michael's. And so the director of uh, the Dear Lady episode, she and I are developing the sold a show to FX and we're making it there. And then there's other shows and there's other features. And so, you know, I'll just keep doing what I can. What do I want to see? I mean, I, I don't want to make you like tell everyone what you're doing next if it's some sort of like studio secret. So I, I sort of want to frame it like, what do you want to do? Like, it feels like you're at this perfect moment with this platform, with this phenomenal artistry you just showed the world. People must be wanting you for a lot. What do you want to do? Uh, I want to do everything. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, I, I would love to see us existing in various genres. You know, I would love to see us in rom-coms. I'd love to see us in horror. Um, that's something I can't tell you what I'm doing, but I am uh, dipping into that realm. Um, and I, I just, my thing is I really want to tell female native narratives that are messy and complex and funny. And I, I really have a desire to focus on our joy. Um, but, you know, with everything that comes with that. Um, and I'm also re recently very interested in, like, the inner world of young native men. Like, I'm really interested in exploring, like, what that looks like. Um, but, yeah, I just I just want to see us in, in any genre we want to be in. And I want to see us a part of other people's narratives as well. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that was one of the things with the show was, like, each episode was meant to be a different genre. You know, you have broad comedy. You have uh, horror. You have, like you know, sort of a link later, walk and talk, you know, you have a 70s episode, you have um, all, like almost every episode is its kind of unique genre. And the idea kind of behind that, not just that that's cool to do, but also shows that we can do everything. Like, like there's, like there's, like in this industry in Hollywood, they always love to find a, yeah, but we're not doing that these days. I literally have heard in the last month, yeah, we're not doing shows like Atlanta and and um, uh, Reservation Dogs anymore. And I didn't hear that from executives, but I've heard that from producers saying, they're not doing that anymore. No one's buying shows like that. Yeah, it's just shifting, you know, because of the writer's strike. We're not doing Atlanta and Reservation Dogs type stuff anymore. It's like, so bullshit. Like, everything is always disproven. In this town, everything gets fucking disproven. Every time you turn around. I don't even know why they say anything. <laughs> and so part of it is like, you know, because they're going to say, once Reservation Talk Dogs comes out, people will start the narrative of like, oh, but they can do that. Like, just the one thing. 
Like the only, the only the one thing they can do. But no, we can do everything. And we showed it with this show. And that was part of the point of it, you know. Yeah, and I think that, you know, just to add to that, I think it's really incredible for the directors that you had on this show. Because what it also does is because each episode was its own genre, it pushes out a bunch of us who are able to direct on this show, showing that you can go from a wide net to a Maximus episode to a California Dream and to, to a dear lady. That, and, and then when you come out, your, your portfolio as a director is pretty diverse because oftentimes what they also want to do in the industry is they want to say like the best question you probably get asked is so what kind of stories do you want to tell or do you want to be a writer or a director more or do you want to do drama or do you want comedy I'm like I do it all like and, and that's like, how oh, I want to would relate. hire you for this but you don't really do comedy do you and it's like I do now I do do comedy you do do comedy <laughs> You're freaking hilarious. <laughs> I'm not saying me. I'm just in general. I know I'm funny. He's funny. Top 50 comedians of last year. <laughs> Variety or whatever it was. <laughs> All right. So the most popular question any person in the industry gets in the city, and I can understand why the city attracts a lot of people who want to make things happen. So Sterling, like, what's your advice? Young native writers, young native creative types, young native maybe perhaps directors, storytellers. I mean, always the same. Make stuff. You know, just make it like if you're waiting for permission from this funky town industry or anything, you're never going to get it. You have to just make stuff. And I think that, um, you know, if you that's what I did. I just made stuff and I kept making it until one day they're like, wow, you made stuff like, wow, you could maybe handle this because you've made a lot of stuff. Um, and I made it for nothing, you know, um, and I think that's always the best way to do it is just make stuff. Um, I would say stay curious and never stop learning. Always look at sort of what you already, your skills you already have, and then look at the ones you need to fill in. You know, it's like, it's, you're never fully arrived. And I think there's like always learning, there's always growing, there's always a new skill in, in this medium to be mastering. So one time I was here to speak at UCLA years ago. And. Tazba was a student here, and we had been friends. The first time I met her, I asked her. We were in Park City <laughs> at Sundance, and I was in a grocery aisle. With each other. I mean, we were shopping for a party. Because they don't sell alcohol on Sundays. And I said, what? He said, can you make fry bread? <laughs> like my first question. And I said, yes. And then I nodded, and we were just friends after that. <laughs> yeah. But um, I was coming to UCLA to speak, and Tazba and I were friends, and so we were like, oh, well, let's do something together. And neither one of us were, like, doing anything in the industry very well, and we didn't have a lot of money. And we were like, but let's go have a fancy dinner. We were trying to feel fancy, you know? And so we went to La Poubelle, like, on Franklin or whatever. Which and we were nervous to even walk inside. I was like, do we have Indian syndrome? Like, we don't think we're allowed in this establishment. Like, do are we dress good enough? Like, what's happening, you know? Um, and we went, we ordered wine and sat down. And we ordered paninis, and I don't know if you've ordered a La Poupelle panini, which is a good place, but this one dish is insane. It came out, it's a panini that looks like every other panini you've ever got at a, at a convenience store, and then just a bag of Lay's chips, like not even like poured into the plate, not even like <laughs> sliced and fried, nothing. It was just a bag of Lay's, which I thought was crazy. That they put on the plate. Yeah, I so just it wasn't it was crazy. even like next to the plate. It was like, this is part of your plating. And we were kind of like disappointed, you know, and just kind of like, oh, this isn't as fancy as we thought. So then I was like, Sterling, do you want to just get 40s and listen to Tupac? <laughs> and we went and got 40s <laughs> and, listened, and listened to Tupac the rest of the night and then read each other my bad poetry and her good poetry together that night. <laughs> On the UCLA guest house yeah. room wherever I don't even know where that is on this campus but no yeah way. at some point it was like very late and we were buzzed and I, we were reading poems and short stories to each other and we're like we're gonna remember this someday when we're on stage at UCLA <laughs> <laughs> well like you like you did with the show it's good to know when to end and to end it on your own terms um <laughs> So one of the things one of the things I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you to please do not like do a surfing of the audience or anything right now. Just stay for a second because we have something else. But I do want to ask everyone to just appreciate these two for the most amazing show. Thank you. Thank you. You didn't even have to tell.
tell him to do that. It's a real one. Hold on. We want to thank you very much for coming out tonight. Um, we have a little gift from you for you guys from the UCLA American Indian Study Center. Killers of the Flower Moon. <laughs>